Okay, so we are now on the last chapter of D1, and this is called Critical Path Analysis. This is uh, pretty different to the rest of the stuff we have in D1. I actually quite like this one, because this chapter here is concerned with managing a big project, whether that's planning an event, building a house, or overseeing the production of a car in a factory. And what we do in these kinds of big projects that we do, uh, that we're looking at, is we kind of look at the smaller component pieces, the activities that make up that project. So, for example, if we were talking about the production of a car in a factory, some of these smaller activities might be putting the engine together or spray painting the exterior of the car or even installing the dashboard controls and the sound system. You can see how all of these small jobs have to come together in order to complete that large project that we have. Now, logically, some of these activities can only take place once others have taken place. In other words, they depend on the completion of previous activities. Similarly, we could say that some activities take priority or precedence over other ones. These must be completed first before others can be completed. So hence, a table which describes this order or this kind of, um, which is the thing, the way that things need to be done, is called a dependence, or most commonly it is called a precedence table that we've got here. And this is kind of our entry point into this sort of topic. We look at all of the different sub-activities that make up a project and we start saying, okay, well, which are the ones that need to be done first? Which are the ones that depend on previous activities. And then throughout this topic, what we do is we then learn how to draw something called an activity network, which starts to bring into the fact how long each of these activities take. Dummy activities is to do with activity networks. Then we start thinking about how early or late tasks need to be completed by. And we then go a little bit further into some more diagrams. We have critical activities floats and then these really important charts called Gantt charts that are still used in sort of managements of projects today's uh, managements of product projects today. And then there's a little bit of A2 content, which includes something called resource histograms, which is pretty similar to a Gantt chart and scheduling diagrams as well. So this feels quite different. It's quite an accessible area of stuff. And we're going to jump back to this example that we've got here of a precedence table. And we're just going to start working our way through all of these different aspects of critical path analysis. So this precedence table that I've got on the left here represents the manufacturing of a sofa with the following component activities. I won't, through re read, I won't read through all of them. We'll just pick out a few things from this table. So for example here, activity E is going to be the an activity that is immediately preceding it, meaning coming before it, is D. So to cover the frame, it has to have had the springs attached to the frame be before we can do that. Now you'll notice it just says the immediately preceding activities because what comes before E is D, but what comes before D is A, which is to build the wooden frame. So it actually goes build the wooden frame, then it's attached the springs to the frame, and then we can cover the frame. And then there's some other stuff that's happening concurrently. So we can see stuff like the fabric needs to be cut out for the cushions but there's no dependency there and then you need to stitch and fill the cushion so c depends on b and then the last thing that depends on c or one of the things that depends on c is f which is to complete the assembly so it's dependent on c and e which is the cushions being filled and the frame being covered. So F needs those things to kind of pull it all together. And you can see we've got a last couple of steps that G is to inspect it, but you can only inspect it once it's been completed. And then our final step, which is H after it's been inspected, is to wrap the sofa so that it's ready for delivery. And obviously this is a pretty simple one where there's not many activities here, but just to kind of show you, this is the kind of headings you might look for. And if there's these dashes, it just means it can start immediately. It doesn't have to depend on any other kind of thing. So we're going to look a little bit more at some precedence tables that we've got here. And this time I'm not going to give you any kind of context that goes with them. You can easily imagine what the context would be in some of these things that I've even suggested at the top. But this one says, given that activity E can only be completed once all other activities have been completed, complete the below precedence table. Now, you might think it can only be completed once all the other ones have been completed. So you might go, oh, great, I'll just do A, B, C, D. But there's this important word here. It does say that it has to be the immediately preceding activities. And because B has been completed, we know that A has been completed. So there's a few of these things we can sort of like disregard. So we know that A has been completed. And actually, we know that B has been completed because C has been completed. Um, or do we know that actually? Yeah, so we know that A and B have definitely been completed because we've got to C and D at this point. So the only ones that E needs to have completed before it can start is therefore C and D. There's no point putting A and B into that list that we've got there because if C, D and uh, sorry, if C 
if we're talking about C and D, that means that B has been completed. And if B has been completed, then A has been completed. So we don't need to include those in the list. Now, there is a way that we can actually do this in a slightly quicker way, because we need to have, if the last one says that it can only be completed once all the other activities have been completed, if that sentence is there that we've got, you need to have all of the letters just in that final column, apart from that E that we've got there. So we do have A, B, C, D. So we've got them all filled in. We've got no missing letters at that point. And it will make a little bit more sense in this example that we've got here. So it's exactly the same question. It says, given that activity G can only be completed once all the other activities have been completed, complete the below precedence table. So this shortcut is include the activities which are not yet written in the column. That will help tell us what goes in here for G. Now this bit that's in blue, that only applies if we're saying that the last thing can be completed once all of the other activities have been completed. It, it might not be that. It might say something like G can only be completed once like D has been completed. And then you just put D in there instead. But if it ever says it's once the other activities have been completed, you have to include the activities which are not yet written in the column. So we've got A, B, C. We don't have D, but we do have E. We don't have F, and obviously we won't put G in there because G is already there. So G can be done once D and F have been completed. D represents that A has been completed, and F represents that E and C have been completed, which also implies that B has been completed because E is there as well. Hence, we've got all of the activities being completed just by using those D and F for them being the immediately preceding activities that we've got there. Now we're going to talk about activity networks, which is a way of taking a precedence table and wanting to kind of represent it in a particular kind of way. So we're going to now be taking precedence tables and trying to draw networks that go with them. And you might need to do it the other way around as well. You might be given a network and do the precedence tables, but that'll be pretty clear after I describe some of these things that we've got. So there are two types of activity network, but we will only be studying the activity on arc type. So what that means is, is that the arcs or the edges are actually representing the activity and they get labelled with the activities letter. So in this example that we've got down here, I don't want you to worry too much about the bracketed parts at this point, but you can see that this arc here or this edge is representing activity A, activity B, activity C, etc, etc. For now, I want you just to ignore the dotted lines, this one, this one, and this one, and this one. We'll learn about those in the future. And the bracketed numbers, we don't need to know what they are at the moment, but you can probably have a sensible guess about what they might be representing. Now, in the way that we do these, these activity on arc type activity networks, they must be straight lines. So we're not going to be doing any curved lines, and we're not going to be having lines crossing over each other or anything like that at all. We also include arrows to define the direction, which is really the direction of this whole thing, the way it's flowing from the start of the project to the end of the project. The nodes or the vertices, they represent events, i.e. the completion of an activity. And they are usually numbered. In this particular case here, they're not numbered. When we do them in the textbook, we do put numbers with them. But when I've been looking through the mark schemes, they are drawn without the numbers. So you don't need to worry too much about the numbering process. And you'll see that in the mark schemes from the most recent Decision 1 exams as well. They literally just look like this with the dots that go between them. But they can be helpful by putting the numbers there. The first node is, is, is numbered as a zero, which is called the source node, where everything is kind of coming from. And the last node is going to be the sync node. Each time a node is added, it is numbered in the order that it is added. So when we look at this one, which I've taken from a, an older exam, I've said, where is the sync and where is the source? Well, it's kind of just looking about the way that the arrows are actually flowing that we've got here. And so hopefully you can identify that this node that we have here is the source that we've got. The source is obviously where all of these things are kind of flowing from. And then the sync is going to be this part here. It's where all of the activity are kind of going towards this final point. No matter if you start here at the source, whatever path you follow, you're going to end up at the sink, which is kind of why it's named like that as well. So we're going to ignore those dotted lines and those bracketed numbers. The source is over here, I've labelled it, and the sink is over here. And interestingly, we used to label the uh, vertices with letters, didn't we? This time we don't label the vertices with letters. They do sometimes get labelled with numbers, or the vertices are just not as meaningful. They're not as important as when we were doing them earlier on in D1. The vertices represent the end of an activity 
rather than an activity it's itself which I, I kind of think makes sense right an activity is like a process it's like actually moving along a line whereas a vertex in this case is like the end of the activity the activity started here and completed here if we're talking about activity i so it does feel different to the previous networks that we've looked at but hopefully it makes sense about why we are saying that the activities are edges rather than the nodes or the vertices so what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and draw a few activity networks and this first one that we're going to do is going to be based on this precedence table and this precedence table i believe is this one that we did in this second example that we've got here and I've written at the top that I see these a bit like solving a puzzle because they can actually be pretty tricky to draw. And the ones that have been asked about recently in exams have been quite challenging. And so I think maybe you'd probably be advised after trying the exercise where there aren't many questions is to go and look at some of the exam questions immediately and see if you can draw the more challenging ones. And here are my tips for this because it really does feel quite puzzly once you get started. My first tip is to always use a pencil and have a rubber at hand. This is not something that I'm just saying because I'm like, oh, they're not going to be very good at it. They might get things wrong. There are so many times where you think you're drawing something right and then you read one of the bits down here and you're like, oh no, my lines don't match up properly. They're not going to work. So I'm going to have to rub this out and try again. You don't rub out the whole thing. You just rub out some of the bits. So do make sure that you have a pencil and a rubber at hand. Only draw a node and number it when needing to add an activity on. Now, this is kind of less important, as I've been saying, that they don't normally need the nodes being numbered in the exam. But it does help you see if you're when you're practicing, it does help you see if you've kind of got the correct setup when you're comparing it to, say, the solution bank or other people that are doing this around you. I've said be prepared to swap edges around. So you might have particular branches where you might have like a branch or an edge coming up that you say is B and one down here that is C. You might end up having to put C up there and B down there. Just be prepared to do that kind of thing. And just a reminder, only straight lines are allowed for this. So let's think about how we're going to start off this. We're going to begin by drawing our sink, our source, sorry, which is just going to be zero. It's our first node. And I think I said that on the previous part here, that the first node is zero. Sometimes you might see it being labeled as a one, depending on kind of which textbook you might look in. But we're pretty much always going to say that the beginning part of it is zero. So coming out of this, we've got these two activities, A and B, which don't depend on anything. So growing out of this zero that we've got here, I'm going to draw two straight lines. I'm going to draw activity A, and I'm also going to have coming out of it activity B like this. And this is weird where we're starting to label these edges with letters rather than numbers like we have done previously. Now I'm going to look at C. We always go through the alphabet. Now C depends on A, so I want it to kind of be growing out of here. So I'm going to draw on a node and number it because I need to add an activity on. So I'm going to draw on that node and I'm going to increase it by one. And I'm now going to say that C depends on A. Oh, and D also does. So I can say here that C depends on A. And I can say that D depends on A. And you can kind of see that backwards precedence by it's growing out of this node. So C and D both depend on A. Now E depends on B. So I need to now number that node. And I'm just going to do it as a straight line for now because I might need to change that in a second. So when I said straight, I meant like a horizontal line like this. So I've done A, B, C, D and E. Now F depends on C and E. This means I want F to have C and E coming into it like this. But it's not really possible in this current setup because I can't have these things overlapping. So what I'm going to do is actually use my third bullet point. I'm going to be prepared to swap some edges around. So instead of it being uh, C, D, I'm just going to say that it is D and C. So I can now have these two activities, C and E, kind of like merging together at a node where I can then have activity F coming out of it. So I'm actually also going to change what E looks like and I'm going to pull E so that it's coming all the way up here like this. So there is E. I need to now say that that is um, three for my third node and coming out of that is going to be F like this. So now I've done F which is dependent on C and E. And then my last one is G, which is going to be dependent on D and F. Let me just move that so that's out of the way. Now, I need it to be dependent on G and F, so it's kind of going to be like this, but with a G and an F. So a D and an F, excuse me. So I'm actually going to get rid of 
this F here and I'm just going to pull it right up there like this. So I'm going to put F like this and I will join them together and say that's my fourth node. And then I need G to be coming out of that. I need that activity G to be coming out. And I'm going to finish that off with a final node to say that we have finished so that we've got this kind of activity network for this. Now, I could have had the uh, D coming along like this and F going like that. It doesn't really matter. You can start to see it compared to other activity networks if they are the same as each other, whether they're like isomorphic graphs. OK, let's now have a go at doing an activity network for this precedence table, which is perhaps a little bit more complex. So I'm going to start off with the um, same tips that we've got here. I'm going to start off with my beginning node of A. Let's start it here with a zero and I'll just draw it coming across like this. Now I've got both B and C depending on A. OK, so I'm going to have to label that as a one. I'm going to do a B and a C. D depends on B. So I'll put a two there and I'll say that D is going to depend on B. E is depending on C, so I'll label that as a 3, and I'm going to say that this is where E is going to be. F depends on E, so I'll put that as a 4, and I'll add in F. And G depends on C, so now I'm going to have another one coming out where from here, and this one is going to be a G that we've got here. Notice how I don't have nodes on the end, I only add the nodes in when I can do something new. Now H is dependent on D and F, so I actually need this F to come and meet D up here. So I'm going to erase that F, I'm going to join it up like this. I can now put a node in here which will be the fifth node because I've already done five, and I can have H coming out of this part. Now I want I to be dependent on G, so I'm going to say this is my sixth one, and I will draw I coming out of this. I want J to be dependent on G as well. So I'm going to need another one coming down here, which is going to be J. And then K needs to be dependent on I. So I'm going to say this is 7. Let's just say that K is coming out like this. And L needs to be dependent on J. So I'm going to say this is my eighth node, and I'm going to put L like this. Now this is interesting because I've now got these things that are not going anywhere at all and there's no more information from the precedence table. So think to yourself about how I might finish this off. Well, this needs to be finished off with a sync. So I'm going to need to redraw the H, the K and the L and they're all going to need to come together at some final sync node that I'm going to have. So I'm going to get rid of the H, the K, the L, just remember those letters, so there's going to be the H, the K, and the L. H, K, L. And that goes to the ninth node like that. So we now do correctly have a source, a sink, and all of these things are kind of flowing in that correct way. And just to show you if you wanted to read something in a backwards kind of way, if we wanted to say what does H depend on, look where H is and see what is flowing into the node that it's connected to, and it's D and it's F. If I wanted to see what, say, G was dependent on, here is G. G is just dependent on C. So you've got these networks here that have all been built up. You can now have a go at doing exercise 8a, but like I said, these do get pretty difficult. And after you've done exercise 8a and 8b, I think you're going to want to go and try some exam questions of drawing some of these yourself because they do get tricky, but they're nice and puzzly. I like them. So come back in the next video and we'll have a look at adding in some dummy activities to these activity networks.